Hello, and welcome to edition two of Video Interface. Here's the stop frame index, and the timings are taken from now. You sent us back over 100 of these reply paid cards from Video Interface Edition 1. And we'd like to thank all of you who took the time to send them back. Briefly, you liked Michael Robb the best. I suppose we expected that. So he's back with us, looking this month at pen computing. More product information, less people, was a common comment. So we will have only one major interview in this edition, and indeed in future. A lack of software demonstrations was noted, so we have remedied that also in this edition. Thanks again to everyone who responded. We have noted and acted upon all your suggestions. Keep sending us your views, and we'll end up with a service that is tailored precisely to your needs. If we can turn to the next edition of Video Interface for a moment, we're going to be talking to David Smith. David is Systems Marketing Manager at Microsoft. He's the man responsible for all aspects of promoting DOS, Windows, Windows NT, and all of Microsoft's developer products in the UK. Send us your questions for David on this month's reply pay card, and we'll pick out a selection to put to him. Now, if you want to hear from Microsoft directly, JWP are hosting an executive briefing at Microsoft's head office in Winnersh on Thursday, the 18th of March. Not, please note, the 11th, as originally advertised in last month's Interface magazine. Beyond that, we're arranging a multimedia seminar right here at Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine in South Kensington. This will take place on Thursday, the 22nd of April. Contact your JWP account manager to book a place on either of these events. Numbers, I'm afraid, are limited in both cases, so please be quick. So, to start edition two of JWP's video interface, here then is the item we had to leave out last time. Kerridge Network Systems have introduced a new cellular fax modem, and Darren Smithson spoke with Ros Kirby of Kerridge. Now, I understand today that you're going to show us how to continue working, even if you get stuck on the dreaded M25 motorway. Absolutely, and uh, of course everybody gets stuck on the dreaded M25. But if you have a portable telephone and you have a portable PC, I'd like to show you exactly how you can make use of that time stuck in that tra traffic jam. You can send important quotations or reports to people just using no paperwork whatsoever from a PC through your mobile telephone mm -hmm. over cellular, and we have a fax machine here set up in the studio, which could be obviously on a standard BT line absolutely anywhere in the UK or indeed wherever. And I'm just going to send this fax over to this machine now. Okay. okay. So that will go <coughs> through to the cellular phone and then out towards the fax, wherever it may be. Absolutely. It'll actually dial out through the phone. Okay. Fax technology on modems isn't particularly new. Mm. What makes your um, product different from the other market brands? Okay, um, quite a number of things. For one thing, the MicroQuin, the modem that we manufacture in Newbury, it is an upgradable modem. It's actually the only upgradable modem in existence. So the idea is once you've purchased it, you can go on to add quite a number of other things afterwards just using software. Oh, so it's upgradable. What do you mean? You add a chip or...? No, no. Different software packages. You can add, for instance, there's a whole range of 12 different things. You can add um, 5250 emulation to access IBM minis, including AS400s with PC support, 3270 for IBM mainframes, there's X25 software, a whole host of them, synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and of course, in the normal async form, it will access normal async services and hosts. The MicroQuin is um, proprietary to the Toshiba D slot. Are there any plans to incorporate, say, PCMTIA? I know that's a, a, a move that a lot of co portable computer companies are moving to. Yes, definitely. We will have a PCMCIA version, a uh, V32Biz, which is 14,400 bits per second, uh, by about the end of the first quarter or so in 1993. But that will only be an asynchronous modem. It's not yet possible to shrink an SDLC board onto a chip in the way that we have with these modems. So it'll just be asynchronous. Do you have any other developments in mind for the MicroQuin? Mm, yeah, quite a few. We have a huge range of upgrades planned for 1993, so the product will just go on, on and on, as it were. Um, V32Biz is one of the software upgrades that will be added, 14,400 bits per second. We'll also have LAN access software, quite a number of different areas. Okay. Let's take a look at this. It's obviously receiving the facts quite nicely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's time, once again, to look at a few news highlights from the industry. I hope you'll forgive me if I start by mentioning JWP's BS5750 accreditation. After a year of hard work, JWP Information Services 
and now a British Standard 5750 registered firm for the supply and delivery of personal computer systems, software packages and consumables. Elsewhere, Hewlett Packard have now announced the DeskJet Portable, just two months after we showed it to you on video interface. Giving laser quality printing on the move, the DeskJet Portable will no doubt be gracing many a briefcase shortly. Lotus have launched a five user starter pack for Lotus Notes, developed to meet the growing needs for notes from small and medium sized companies, and requested by corporates keen to trial groupware applications. The Notes starter pack is at a special promotional price of £995. And if you haven't already heard, JWP are pleased to announce our appointment as a Lotus Notes authorised reseller. We have also just been appointed an Oracle Systems reseller. We believe this will be a major benefit to our customers and we'll be telling you more in the future interfaces and video interface magazines. If you have an immediate interest, however, please contact your JWP account manager. Recent software product announcements include the Windows version of Borland's Paradox, WordPerfect 5.2, PageMaker 5 and Freelance 2, all of which have made their appearance since the last edition of Video Interface. Most of these announcements were of course timed to coincide with the Windows show. For those of you who didn't get to go, or couldn't get in, we sent Darren Smithson down to Olympia to report. If the Windows show proved anything, it proved that software developments continue to dominate the interests of end users, with attendees actually turned away from the exhibition. So, after the disappointing attendances at other multi-purpose computer shows, should we therefore qualify the Windows show as a success? It's true that there is a tendency to judge exhibitions by the number of people who attend, but in fact it's the quality of your audience that really matters. If anything, there were too many people at the Windows exhibition for it to prove of any real value, for corporate clients at least. This was a shame because the lineup of exhibitors and the breadth of applications shown was actually quite good. As you would expect, most of the biggest names were there, Word Perfect, Lotus Borland and of course the mighty Microsoft, who also had the largest stand. No surprises there. It was also nice to see a number of smaller developers at the show, people like GST and Delrina, for example. Given that the show was so popular and the lineup of exhibitors so good, you may ask why I felt it was the letdown. The real problem was simply over subscription. The noise alone was too much to allow a real analysis of any of the products on show, while the constant jostling and battling to get from one stand to another would have worn down even the most hardened of attendees. What's more, a vast section of the audience were other developers, dealers and small users. While there's no doubt that these people have a right to see what's happening in the industry, perhaps an idea for future events would be to have a specific corporate day. This would allow the people who decide on the software platforms of their company to have a more relaxed look at the alternatives on view. Some would argue that the conference side of the Windows show, which was subscription only, was for corporate clients. But it's very useful to follow up a seminar on a product with the kind of interactive demonstrations that an exhibition would allow. Despite the number of people at the Windows show, this reporter believes that changes in format need to be made. If not, then like most of the events that Interface has attended in the last two years, even the Windows show runs the risk of becoming just another computer shopper show. I don't think the corporate audience would be too impressed if this occurs, neither would the major exhibitors. We'll let you know in advance if any changes in format do occur for next year's event. Talking of exhibitions, IBM 93 happens about the time you should receive this video. We expect IBM to show OS2 version 2.1. That's the version with Windows 3.1 support. But the product will not ship until later this month. Our advice? Look out for the various IBM announcements late in March. Also, on the strategic side of the news, information has started to trickle out about Microsoft Chicago, the alleged 32-bit successor to Windows 3.1. One NT developer has apparently already dubbed it NT Lite. It is reported that it can be thought of as a mixture of DOS 7 and Windows for workgroups. It's 32-bit technology providing preemptive multitasking. Chicago allegedly fits between Windows 3.1 and NT, where the hardware required to run NT for a single user may be too costly to justify the returns that the better operating system provides. Don't forget, however, none of this happens until next year. In the meantime, DOS 6 will make an appearance shortly. It includes a built-in virus checker and disk capacity doubler. You can learn more at the up-and-coming JWP Microsoft Strategic Briefing. WordPerfect have just acquired a controlling interest in Reference Software International, the company that produces Grammatic, the grammar checking software product. As Grammatic is already bundled with WordPerfect 5.2 for Windows, it seems a natural move. An amusing side, 
is that in France and Italy, Lotus and Microsoft have licenses to use Grammatic in AMI Pro and Word. And WordPerfect will receive an admittedly small royalty for every copy sold. Finally, it was at the Windows show that Lotus Improv for Windows was seen for the first time. It is billed as the first dynamic Windows spreadsheet and is seen by many as the most important spreadsheet development since the original Lotus 123. In the US, PC Week called it an extraordinary product, and the Wall Street Journal said, Improv will represent a whole new level of clarity and ease of use in spreadsheets. No doubt you already have a spreadsheet, but Improv may make you want a second. I saw Improv just before its release, and I must say I was very impressed. We thought you should see it too, so here's Steve with Neil Hudspeth, Improv Product Manager at Lotus UK. Neil, welcome to Video Interface. Thank you very much for the invite. Pleased to be here. Neil, you've got five minutes to show us how Improv is different from any regular spreadsheet and why it's been getting all these wonderful reviews. OK, a tough task, but we'll try. Um, let me point out some things which are similar and some things which are different to a conventional spreadsheet. Okay. Anybody who's used any of our Windows products will recognise some of the similar things. They'll recognise the smart icon bar at the top. They'll recognise the smart status bar, very successful in Ami Pro 3 at the bottom. And they'll recognise maybe the, the little mail icon here. Um, because Improv, of course, is mail enabled for Lotus CC Mail and Lotus Notes. Right. Um, if you're a conventional spreadsheet user, the first big difference you'll notice is there's no A, B, C, D, E across the top, and there's no 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 down mm. the side. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the reason for that is, is because the way you define an Improv model is using the terms that you use every day in your business and you're comfortable with. So in, in, in this application, we've got a number of line items down the side here. We've got a number of, of products, SLR cameras, video cameras, binoculars off the screen and so on. Mm -hmm. We've got three regions, US, Europe and Asia, and a total off the side, and this year and next year. So that's the way you define the model. But the really big difference between Improv and the conventional spreadsheet is something we call dynamic views. And let me show you how that works. Mm. This is an application we built for a finance manager. Financial manager is going to present it to the board, but before he presents it to the board, he wants to get the sales director to agree the unit sales figures, and he wants to get the marketing director to agree the revenue figures and feel right. comfortable with them. Yeah. Now, the sales director will say, this is all very well, but these unit sales figures are, there's a lot, row here, and there's a row here, and there's some more rows off the bottom. Can I have a report that groups them together, please? Right. And in the conventional spreadsheet, you'd have to rebuild the spreadsheet, maybe create a new block of rows and mm. copy those in. Mm. A lot of work. A lot of work, and very error prone. Mm. In, in Improv, in Lotus Improv, all you have to do is drag and drop. With the mouse, you grab hold of this tile called Product here, you lift it up, you drag it to the other side of the tile called Line Item, you let go, and there are all your unit sales figures grouped together. Right. So just drag and drop, just grab the tile, lift it up, and drag it. To give the marketing director the report he wants, just a simple, in this case, we'll drag the Line Item up here, we'll drop it in that box. Mm -hmm. He's only interested in revenue, so we'll page through to revenue. Oh, I see. So we've got sort of like a, a 3D spreadsheet here with multiple pages now. A 3D spreadsheet with multiple pages, but you can in fact go up to 12 dimensions if you can get your mind around that. Mm, no, I don't think I can <laughs> actually. Um, and he <laughs> wanted to see for each of these columns this year and next year right. side by side, so we just pull the year tile down there. And we can mm. go on redesigning the spreadsheet just by dragging the mouse. We no mm. longer have to build new spreadsheets or do maybe file links or DDE links mm. to present the information in different ways to different bench list managers in the ways they feel comfortable. Right. So that's the first big difference between Improv and, the and a conventional spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. The second is the way we write formula. Um, now, I was going to say, how do you do that without rows and columns? Exactly. Numbers? We can't call this cell A1 anymore. No, correct. Um, it doesn't exist. So we had to invent a new programming language for mm -hmm. spreadsheets. That language is called English. And you'll oh, see I that all the formula pane... I might be able to cope with English, yes. Okay. <laughs> all the formulas are grouped together down here at the bottom in a formula pane. Right. And, and you can re I'm sure you can read them and understand them, as, as can the, the viewers, mm -hmm. without me having to explain them. Yeah, so um, it says here, revenue equals unit sales times the average price and cost of goods equals unit sales times unit cost. Yes. Exactly okay. right. Yes. And they were Very exactly logical. The yes, I can read that you know, as you would say. Yeah. And they're exactly the same terms that we use, that we use in our business when we set up the model. Mm -hmm. A couple of other things to notice about the formula. Let me just reset the line items back down the side here. You can see that we've got a, a line here for revenue and as we page down we've got a, another row for revenue and another row for revenue. Mm -hmm. But we've only got one formula for revenue here. Yeah. And that's because the formula in Improv are general. That means they apply everywhere that is relevant for them to apply. Right. Now, 
That is because that's the way we found spreadsheet users worked. Typically, they would type their formula into that cell, they copy it into these cells, and then they copy it somewhere else and mm. wherever else. In improv, you don't have to do that anymore. The formula applies everywhere. But of course, if you do need a specific formula, maybe for binoculars, you could override that right the way down to cell level. Right. The other big benefit of doing it this way is if we wanted to change this formula for any reason, we only have to change it in one place. We don't have to remember everywhere else we've copied yeah, it. You so don't have to remember where in your spreadsheet this original formula existed. Exactly anymore. right, which right. means it's much easier to maintain the spreadsheet over time. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to understand the spreadsheet when you come back to it after nine months, because you can actually read what's going on rather mm -hmm. than having to greet with, greet with B$24. Mm -hmm. Because it's much more obvious if you, if you make an error, if you write profit equals sales minus headcount, it's pretty obvious you got it wrong. Um, <laughs> yes. Whereas B256 equals B132 yeah, minus B32 could be anything. Yeah. It makes a spreadsheet far easier to use. I, th I think I'm beginning to be impressed. And I presume it does graphs and, and all that sort of thing. It well. does all the sort of things you'd expect spreadsheets to do. As you can see, we've got some color on the spreadsheet. You can, you can format the sheet. You can change the fonts, the font size. You can underline numbers. There's a complete presentation side where you can build graphs, add tables of numbers, add lines, add macro buttons. And indeed, because it's OLE and DDE, client and server, you can embed sound. You could embed <laughs> an AmiPro document. You yeah, could okay. even embed enough, a video enough, clip. Enough. <laughs> I want one. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Lotus have very kindly uh, agreed to put a thousand of these improv guided tour discs in with the cassettes so have a play with it to yourself Neil thank you very much for joining us here thank today. you very much for the opportunity and now it's over to Darren in the last edition of video interface we introduce you to the superb Hewlett Packard LazyJet 4 printer since its introduction demand has exceeded all expectations but however the computer industry is not renowned for allowing technology to stand still Already a third party company have produced a product which significantly increases the capabilities of the printer and that product is the LaserMaster WinJet 1200. With us today we have Sarah Alexander, printer product manager with distributor Aptech. Sarah, we've already established that the LaserJet 4 prints at 600 dpi. What are the benefits of adding a WinJet 1200? Okay, well, let me explain. What we've got is we've got the Winjet 1200 running with the LaserJet 4, mm -hmm. and over this side we've got the LaserJet 4M. Mm -hmm. I've prepared two 1 meg files, which will be printing out on two 486 33 megahertz. Right. If I just press the keys here, okay. we can print that file. Now, that file um, contains both line art, text, and graphics, mm -hmm. so we'll get a, a general perspective of what the product can do. But in essence, the Winjet 1200 um, firstly gives you speed. We speed up all your Windows printing. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we give the LaserJet 4 PostScript. Mm -hmm. okay? And last but not least, we also give you multiple resolutions. Mm -hmm. Today we'll be printing at 1200 DPI, right. but you also have a choice of 600 and 300 okay. DPI. Okay, so who would use a 1200 DPI printer? Right, well, First off, people that are looking for camera ready to produce camera ready artwork. Mm -hmm. um, so people with small publication runs. Um, but in summary, people are going to be wanting to look for crisper text, mm -hmm. um, much better quality half tones, mm -hmm. and um, much better line art as well. Okay. Who wouldn't use a Winjet 1200? Well, I said at the beginning, the whole point of the Winjet 1200 is to speed up your Windows printing. Right. Um, so people that are printing DOS applications or OS2 in Unix. Mm -hmm. um, also, people that are going to be printing spreadsheets wouldn't require 1200 DPI. Mm -hmm. But, um, Darren, one thing we're not selling here, though, is a 1200 DPI typesetter. Right. Um, and I think we have to make that point clear. What we have got is a very good personal image setter. Okay. So we've established who should and who shouldn't use a 1200 DPI printer. Surely the cost would remain a factor, though? No, not at all. The Winjet 1200 retails at £890. Um, so really, the difference between uh, the, buying the HP4 and the Winjet 1200 versus the 4M is mm -hmm. only a matter of £100 or so. OK. Well, the LesJet 4 is now printing. And Correct me if I'm wrong, this is printing at 1200 dpi. Exactly. And the 4M, which is uh, running from the 486 as well, is only running at 600 dpi. Exactly. OK, so the 4 that started first. And as you can see here, we've got a mixture of both text, line art, and half tones. OK, and this LazyJet 4M is just catching up now, so we'll compare the differences. We just lift that up. There's and a there we have it. Big difference 
Um, I think that you can see with the naked eye there. But the line art certainly picks it up. OK. I think it'll be interesting to see where printed technology is going to take us in the next 12 months. Thank you very much for coming and showing us this development, Sarah. And in the meantime, here's the top 20 from Frontline. Surely most of us who use a computer regard the keyboard as an inevitable part of the process. We may have graduated to mouse or rollerball, but the keyboard remains the logical way of getting data into the computer. Well, don't take things for granted. This is the NCR3125. It's one of a new generation of portable computers which allows the user to interface with the system in the most natural way of all by using a pen and by writing on the pad. If you're uh, pulled up for speeding in the US state of Washington, the police officer will be equipped with something like this. Now this is connected by radio to the computer at police headquarters. So the first thing the officer does is carefully record the details of the offending driver's license and it asks him for the expiry date shall we say 31st 12 of the year 2001 and the state well they always speed in California I'm sure so we'll put him down as coming from California now we transmit via radio that information to base. Now the system offers us a real subtlety here because it will enable the officer to check that Miss Jones hasn't changed her status. If she's become a male, it'll record that. If she's altered the color of her eyes, those two go into the new details. And if her height is no longer 4'9", um, say for the sake of demonstration she's become 5 feet for some reason, that too is recorded. Now. What has she been doing wrong? She's been speeding. What is the posted speed that she should have been traveling at? Should we say that that's 30? The actual speed at which she was traveling at, let's make it dramatic, let's say 80. It immediately computes the penalty. She's a lady of means, so she'll pay by credit card. And the deal is almost complete. The officer then signs the form, the driver signs her part of the form and we transmit the details back to base. Faster fines, greater efficiency. NCR and other manufacturers think that that sort of application is typical of where pen computing can make a real contribution. Structured data capture screens, no need for a tremendous amount of data to go in, but it is critical that it's got there fast and accurately. Insurance consultants are using devices like these in their interviews with clients now. They can then download the information into the base mainframe and get a response back to their business prospect in hours. Not so very long ago when they were using pen and paper, it used to take weeks. The technology is in principle very simple. There is in this screen a matrix of electromagnetically sensitive wires tightly packed together. And there's a permanent magnet in the tip of the pen and it's the movement of the pen across the matrix which is detected and recorded. But this technology is actually 12 months old. Let me show you now the very latest NCR 3130. It may look the same as its predecessor, indeed it has the same 386 processor, but this is much more powerful. It's up from 20 megabytes of hard disk storage to 60 megabytes. Four hours of rechargeable battery and it has the big advantage of a backlit screen. And it gives me a chance to show you the Windows package, which is designed to help you come to terms with writing for a computer. There's plenty of hints as to how to do it, but this is perhaps the uh, most immediately interesting area. 
Here are some letters and boxes, and you're invited to see how you can succeed in getting the computer to recognize what it is you're trying to say. Well, it's failed me on my F. It thinks it's an E. So let me demonstrate how the system shows you, down in the bottom corner, the sort of outline it will accept for an F. So let's have another go. On top of the E, it's a hook, vertical, and a horizontal. Now, all this may seem a bit of a fiddle, but one pharmaceutical company reckons that it has saved 20% in the lead time of getting a new product to market simply by getting its specialists to input the results from the clinical trials through a device like this. 20% time saved, surely extra business that couldn't be achieved any other way. Complying with all open standards and meeting the new PCM CIA criteria for pen computing, the NCR 3130 looks set to transform the results of many businesses without, and this is perhaps the most interesting part of all, transforming the way in which those businesses are conducted. It'll still be a case of putting pen, well, almost, to paper. Here's Steve. With me now is Reggae Helms, who is Managing Director of Borland International UK. Welcome to the program, Reggae. Thank you, and thank you for being here. It's a very nice and interesting way in getting in contact with a lot of new customers and, and customers we already have. Well, we think so. I'd like to talk to you first about Windows products, if we yeah. may. You've had some superb reviews for Quattro Pro for Windows, and indeed they're starting to come through for Paradox for Windows, your latest product. Um, a lot of people have said that Quattro Pro is their favorite spreadsheet in reviews and so forth. It's really make or break time for these volume sales of Windows products for, for Ball and now, isn't it? Yes, it is. We've been uh, pretty late to the market with uh, especially Paradox and Quattro Pro for Windows. And um, we see a huge sales, huge volume sales of both products now. It's very interesting and it's extremely encouraging for us because we did have a fear that we were coming too late, but it doesn't look like it. I think Paradox Windows is probably one of the most evaded uh, database products on the market, so uh, it's good news for us at the moment. One mm -hmm. well, thing I, I suppose I must ask you, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people want me to ask you, is the future of DBase. Um, because at the time of the takeover of Ashton Tate, the two products, that is Paradox and DBase, were positioned very differently. Mm -hmm. But in terms of accessibility to the user and in terms of features and so forth, they seem to be coming very much closer together. Are they going to become one product at some time in the future? Well, it's, it's one of these most common questions I've been asked since the uh, takeover of Ashton Tate last year. Uh, first of all, Borland is extremely committed to DBase. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, our DAS product has been, um, is coming out in a new release next month with a compiler. It's a DAS version. We are still uh, finalizing our Windows version. When it's coming out, I can't say today. But um, some of the things that we have been doing with uh, DBase of Windows was we started absolutely from scratch. And uh, not too long ago, we brought up some technology which we are going to implement in the DBase of Windows uh, version. The other thing is that um, building database products today is not as easy as it used to be. You have to take into consideration a totally new environment, client-server environment, mm -hmm. and you have to make sure that your products that you're bringing out to the marketplace is able to have SQL links and connectivity links to other platforms. And uh, that's one of the reasons why Paris Windows took longer, and also the reason why DBase Windows took longer. We are very committed to DBase, and we don't want to compromise on that product. So that's the reason why we are still, you know, getting it together. Mm. It will be coming. Right. So the two products will continue separately. It will certainly, yes. And it will never ever be the same product because there's a huge amount of DBase users who's used to use DBase for years and years and years. The same with the Paradox environment. And it is two different products and two different development products as well. Mm. You, you're talking there about client-server and, yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, if I link that with a, a fact that I know, that, and that is that database products are actually becoming a larger part of Borland's overall product offerings. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, you can say that. I mean, um, Borland is the information management system company now. And uh, some of the things that we are extremely um, 
geared towards is having database products for all sorts of different environments. We have it for DOS, Windows, we will have it for NT. Mm. Uh, we might have it for OS too, but we certainly also have a server product now, Interbase, which we acquired uh, with the Aston Tate last year. That's one of the, the, our products that is growing the most at the moment. And we're building organizations to handle the client server and the solution sales aspect for the future. But Interbase is probably going to be market totally different from any other competitors on the marketplace from Oracle and Sybase. So yeah, we are much more a database company than anything else with um, utilities to develop applications for databases as well. Mm. You, you mentioned Oracle just then. Yeah. And, uh, could this be the direction that, that Borland is, is heading in with databases becoming even more important to you than they ever were before? Can we see in some far future time Borland becoming another Oracle type of company? No, never. Um, Borland is going to uh, market their server products totally different from what Oracle is doing. We will continue being a very small company compared to Oracle and other people in, uh, in the industry. We're working closely with third parties. We're, closing, uh, we're, we're having much closer relationship with most of our system integrators and developers in general who can support customers for the server environment or for the uh, normal uh, client environment, we cannot um, afford to build an organization like Oracle's. We don't see any needs for it because we have so many good um, uh, third parties out there who is much better at building that business than we are. Mm -hmm. So we will probably start doing um, our business with the servers extremely differently from what you see today. And it's very interesting. It's a uh, it's a, an extremely interesting move for the company. Mm. Um, a question occurs to me as we talk, will you widen the number of platforms that, uh, that Ball and Products currently address as well? Well, today we have DOS versions, OS2 versions, Windows versions. We also have Unix versions. DBase is, a, is in a Unix version, both for Unix and, and VMS. And uh, Interbase runs on Unix platforms. And you know we have a large variety of different platforms. We are committed in the future to develop tools for a large variety of platforms because that's what the corporation wants. Our customers says, you know, we will have a mixture of platforms in the future. We have huge investments in Unix, we have huge investments in DAS, and we want to continue those platforms. And what can you do to support us with the same product, the same front end for the users, so they don't have to learn another platform, but what can you do? And that's actually how we're building our products. So for instance, Opric Vision, which is uh, whatever you call it, a, a visual um, a design tool or a front end tool, is the same whether you run it on Windows or whether you run it on OS2. It's exact, exactly the same product we're talking about. Um, but it runs on different platforms. But for the user's point of view, they never ever see anything else mm. than the front end. And that's what we are what doing. Right. One question, how's Paradox for Windows selling? How's it going? <laughs> yes. Uh, I think that uh, that's probably one of the, uh, the best surprises this year for us. As I started out saying, um, we thought we were a bit too late with this product. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it's probably been one of the most evaded database products on the marketplace. Um, some, some sources close to the company have told us that we outsold Access within two weeks in the retail Really? Outlets. So it's pretty encouraging, and I mm -hmm. think the price point was right, and it's it's encouraging much more users to actually evaluating Paradox now rather than waiting until you know budgets gets better or times gets better, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, we certainly have got a product out there in huge volumes. Mm -hmm. I can't give you any numbers. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, we'll we'll let you off on the numbers, but I'm, I'm not going to let you off answering one question, and that is, would you like before you leave to confirm or deny some rumours? Okay. <laughs> oh dear. And that is that that Borland are about to buy or be bought by. Uh, recently, we've had Novell, uh, we've had WordPerfect, and most recently Lotus. Would, would you like to comment on that? Well, I heard IBM last week. Oh, did you? Yes. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> well. Um, Honestly, I don't have a clue. When we acquired Aston Tate, nobody knew. Even the Financial Times got the story upside down. There's always rumors like this. And um, I think Borland is now turning around from being in an investment year with a lot of problems after an acquisition and mm -hmm. is now coming out on the, the right side. We are committed to build on what we have. Um, there shouldn't be any reasons for us to go out and acquire another spreadsheet as for Lotus 
acquire another uh, spreadsheet, but they might look mm. into uh, wanting a database. But there's absolutely no confirmation or anything like that, and I, I do hope not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming in and talking to us today. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And now here's Darren. During February, Toshiba announced their intention to move into the pen computer marketplace. With us today to give us an exclusive preview ahead of the official launch at CBIT later this month is Guy Twidale from Toshiba. Hello, Guy. Hello, Darren. Well, as you say, exclusively for JWP, this is the Toshiba T100X computer. As you can see, it's a less than A4 format machine. It weighs 1.5 kilograms, which is just over three pounds. Mm -hmm. It has an AMD 386 low power processor, four megabytes of RAM, a 40 megabyte hard disk, and comes with two PCMTIA slots in the top, and serial port, floppy disk drive, printer port, and a PS2 keyboard port down the side. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to give you a little idea of the power of the pen, I've got a little application here which I'd like to show you. Okay, uh, here we've got an, a nice graph, and if we wanted to change that into a three dimensional graph, I would simply tap three times on the screen mm -hmm. and it turns to a three dimensional graph. Uh, if I wanted to change it to a pie chart, I would just draw a P on the front of it, mm -hmm. change it to a pie chart. Uh, similarly, if I wanted to change it to a line graph, I would just draw an L. I hope that gives you a little snippet of things to come. Thank you, Guy. My pleasure. We'll, of course, have a full demonstration of the product in the next edition of Video Interface. In the meantime, please don't forget to send your questions in for David Smith at Microsoft or to contact your JWP account manager if you wish to attend any of the forthcoming briefings. That's all for this edition of Video Interface. Bye-bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>